sorry, this, uh, there you go. I uh, enlarged it and it uh, started playing on me. So this is uh, Mr. Ballin, a disaster you've never heard of is still controlling our timeline. I was told this is pretty good. So we're gonna do it. All right, before we get started, there's a thanks button on the channel. You can donate, you don't have to. All donations are appreciated. If you request something, it moves to the top of the list. You can still request things. It just takes a little bit more time to get to. Uh, subscribe if this is the type of stuff you like. Click the bell because it notifies you for things. I don't know if I have a garage sale, I guess it'll tell you. I don't know. And if you don't want to do any of that, click the thumbs up button. So let's get into the video. One night in 1944, an American military pilot was flying over England when he turned around in his cockpit and looked at this panel of switches that was right behind him. And after looking for a particular switch, he reached out and he was about to toggle it, but he stopped because he knew what he was about to do, flipping the switch, would easily be the most dangerous thing he had ever done in his entire life. But this was his duty. He had to do it. And so after taking a deep breath, he flipped the switch and immediately chaos ensued and the course of American history would be drastically changed forever. If you've never heard the story before, and many people have not, this is not nearly as well known as it should be, then you are in for a huge reveal at the end. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please secretly log in to the like button's computer and then transfer all of their Bitcoin to your untraceable offshore account. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. At around 5.30 p.m. on the evening of August 12, 1944, a young American military pilot named Joe walked out of his quarters on his base in England where he was stationed. And as soon as he was out... Why does he look familiar? Joe. He looks like somebody. I don't know. Huh. Side, he lit a cigarette to calm his nerves, and as he smoked the cigarette, he began walking towards the huge hangar on the other side of the base where his plane was waiting for him. Joe had been preparing for this night for weeks. He and his co-pilot, a 35-year-old lieutenant who was nicknamed Bud, were about to step off on a top secret military mission called Operation Aphrodite. And this mission was not only top secret, but it was so unbelievably dangerous that basically anybody who knew about it considered it a suicide mission. But Joe tried not to think about that as he walked towards the hangar. Instead, he tried to think about the reason he was here in the first place, the reason he had joined the military, and that was to defeat the Nazis. And what he and his co-pilot were about to do, Operation Aphrodite, was going to play a huge role in defeating the Nazis. So this was about five years into World War II, and at this point, the Nazis were actually losing. However, it was making them more dangerous, not less, because they were becoming very, very desperate. And so they were launching all these outrageous attacks, basically because they had nothing to lose. And one horrible thing the Nazis were doing at this time were dropping these things called vengeance weapons. Hitler called them vengeance weapons. They were basically these huge bombs that the Nazis would drop arbitrarily across the United Kingdom on major population centers. And by this point in the war, these vengeance weapons had killed over 5,000 civilians. And at this exact moment, like this night, as Joe was walking towards the hangar, the Nazis had a stash of vengeance weapons aimed directly at London. That was going to be their next target. And so the mission that Joe and his co- Just a quick side note. Um, people who don't know, my dad was born in London in 1945 during the war. And the home that he was, he, he was born in a home um, the home that he was born in, one of these attacks happened and a bomb went off not too far from where my grandmother gave birth to him 
and it cracked the mantle on the fireplace. And in 2000, 2004, my mom, my dad, and my grandma, my dad's mom, um, all three are gone now. They went uh, to London and uh, they, I think I've told the story before, but they went to the home, knocked on the door, and my grandmother said, yeah, I used to live here and I gave birth to this man, right, you know, wherever in the house. And the woman said, oh, you know, oh really? And she goes, yeah, is the fire, is the uh, mantle still cracked from the bombs that, that struck? And the woman looked at her and said, come on in, I'll, I'll make some tea. So they just walked in the house. You couldn't do that in America, but they just walked in the house and then she was just like, yeah, go ahead and walk around, check out the house, see if anything's different. <laughs> just, just crazy. It's crazy as an American, you know, I'd be like, yeah, the mantle's still cracked, now beat it. <laughs> That's just not what we do here. But it's just a side note. Pilot Bud were going on, Operation Aphrodite was going to be to go out and destroy those vengeance weapons to save London. And as nervous as Joe was about this mission, and he was really nervous, he was also very excited. He actually had volunteered for this mission when many other pilots had done everything they could to stay away from this mission. And on top of that, Joe actually had flown enough missions by this point in the war that he didn't need to fly anymore. He could just go home. But instead, he volunteered for this mission. And a reason why Joe might have decided to do that has a lot to do with the family he was raised in. So Joe came from a family that was very successful and accomplished, and his father really pushed Joe and his younger brother to be the very best at whatever they Sorry. That looks like the Kennedys. Now I don't know what Joe looks like, but that, that father looks like the Kennedy father. When the other picture, when I said the guy looked familiar, he looked like um, Senator Ted Kennedy. He looked like a young Ted Kennedy in the face, but it's not him. Now. JFK lost a brother in World War II. I don't remember his name though. Accomplished, and his father really pushed Joe and his younger brother to be the very best at whatever they were doing and to be very competitive with each other. And so while Joe and his younger brother did love each other, they also had a pretty intense rivalry. And for a while, Joe's father obviously favored Joe. I mean, Joe was the favorite child and, you know, his father would always say, Joe's going to be the president someday. He's yep, this is, uh, okay, yeah, this is the Kennedy family. Yep. so talented. But after the attack on Pearl Harbor that brought the United States into World War II, both Joe and his younger brother joined the military, and pretty early on in the war, Joe's younger brother got an award for heroism. He had basically saved his platoon of men, and he won all these awards, and he was all over the news. And pretty quickly after that, Joe felt like he fell out of favor with his dad, that his dad kind of looked at the younger brother as being the favorite child now. And so Joe really started to feel insecure and wanted to prove himself really to his dad. And so when Operation Aphrodite came up, Joe volunteered for it really because he wanted to be a hero. He wanted to show his dad that he too could do something huge and change the course of history. And he would change the course of history 
but not in the way he expected. And so Joe continued to smoke a cigarette and hustled across the base towards the hangar. And as he did, he found himself kind of speeding up, like he just wanted to get over there and get started. Joe's commanders had given him a special code he would call out over the radio if this mission was successful. It was spade flush, that's what he'd say over the radio. And so as Joe hustled towards the hangar, he imagined how incredible it was going to be to yell out spade flush over the radio. I mean, it was only like 30 minutes away from that moment. This was a short mission. And so finally, Joe reached the hangar and he looked up to the sky one more time to make sure the weather looked solid because actually they had tried to launch Operation Aphrodite a couple of days earlier, but it had been canceled because of fog but Joe looked around and the weather looked good and so he knew it was gonna be a go so he flipped his cigarette butt and stepped into the hangar inside this hangar was this massive big open space and in the center of the hangar on the floor was this huge plane called a b-24 liberator this was of course Joe's plane for the night and so Joe immediately began walking towards the plane to check it out. Now, this particular type of plane was the type of plane Joe had been flying for the past three years. I mean, he'd flown many combat missions in this type of aircraft, so he was very familiar with it. But this particular B-24 was unlike any of the other B-24s Joe had ever flown. In fact, this aircraft was so unique, it was unlike any aircraft that any pilot in the American military had ever flown. I mean, this was really a one of one. And so as Joe walked around the outside of this plane, he began to notice some of these unique modifications that the mechanics had made to this aircraft. The most noticeable modification was actually the cockpit. Now, normally the cockpit had all these windows basically all around it so the pilot could look in any direction and see what was going on, but obviously they needed to be protected from the elements. But this B-24 had all the glass removed except for one pane of glass basically right in front of where Joe would be staring, just like a single windshield. And so it's almost like it was a convertible aircraft where it was all open air in the cockpit. And the reason for this change is because Joe and his co-pilot during the course of this top secret mission, Operation Aphrodite, they would have to jump out and parachute to the ground. And so by having this all open, it would allow them to do that much easier. And then another big modification to the B-24 is the guns that were normally located on the outside of the aircraft were gone and they were replaced by broomsticks painted black to look like guns at a distance. But the visible changes to this particular B-24 were nothing compared to the massive changes that were hidden inside this aircraft because the top secret part of Operation Aphrodite was really this particular plane. The plane was not really a plane. It was more like a huge flying bomb. The military's mechanics basically hollowed out the entirety of this plane, removed everything inside of it that was not absolutely vital, and they replaced it with explosives. 10 tons of explosives. Like, this is an unbelievable amount of explosives. A few minutes later, at around 5.55 p.m., Joe and his co-pilot Bud, who by this point had come into the hangar... So they lo they, their plane is loaded with 10 tons of explosives, and they're they're supposed to jump out of it? What the hell? Are they jumping out? I don't know what the autopilot situation would be, but it can't be what it is today. Are they jumping out, parachuting down, and then that plane's just gonna run out of gas and just like, I don't know. Finished doing their exterior inspection of the aircraft, and then they climbed into the cockpit with Joe taking a seat in the pilot's seat and Bud sitting in the co-pilot's seat. And even though the evening was cool, both men were visibly sweating. Once the pilots got the go-ahead to begin the mission, Joe fired the first engine and then turned to look at the ground crew all around them, and he noticed all of them looked really, really serious. I mean, they obviously knew how intensely dangerous this mission really was, and the fact was, you know, the pilots might not make it home, and so they're looking up at these guys like, I'm sorry you have to do this. But Joe, you know, he looked out at these people and he sensed that was going on, and so he made a big show to wave and smile at them, to show confidence, like he knew what he was gonna do, he's gonna be fine. But in reality, Joe really was terrified. In about 10 seconds, I'm gonna hold something up in front of the camera that our team has been working on for over a year, and it's finally ready to be revealed, and we know you're gonna love it. 
All right, drum roll please, here we go. And it's the Strange, Dark, and Mysterious delivered in book format. The official Mr. Ballin graphic novel. Our first... Um, Joe had all four propellers. Sorry, if you were wanting to get no news on the graphic novel. By 5.59 p.m., Joe had all four propellers spinning on the aircraft, and so he released the brake and began taxiing out to the runway. And as they bumped along, Joe and Bud became really aware of just how heavy this aircraft was from all the explosives. I mean, every bump, this plane is lurching up and down and really creaking and making lots of noises. I mean, this was sketchy. Finally, Joe went full speed ahead, and he and Joe went tearing down the runway, and at some point, the plane did get lift, and it took off into the air. And then just up ahead of him were six other planes that had just taken off moments before who were going to escort Joe and Bud to their target area. Once Joe got the plane to its cruising altitude, he and Bud kind of relaxed for a second and began preparing themselves for what was going to happen next. They had about 15 minutes of just kind of casual flying before the real work of this mission began. The vengeance weapons that Joe and Bud were going out to destroy as part of Operation Aphrodite were located about 120 miles south, just outside of this little town in the very northern tip of France. But destroying these weapons would not be as simple as just Joe and Bud flying over top and releasing all their explosives and flying back home because the Nazis had buried these vengeance weapons deep inside the hills in this town in northern France. And so regular bombs wouldn't touch these vengeance weapons. They had to do it a different way. And the way they were going to do it was Joe and Bud were going to fly their plane directly into the hills. And the way they would do this is they would fly their plane as close to the target area as possible, at which point one of the other pilots that were in the escort planes would take remote control of the B-24 flying bomb. And then once they had remote control, Joe and Bud, who no longer needed to do anything, they would jump out and parachute to the ground. And then the pilot who was remotely flying this now vacant B-24 flying bomb, they would just set it on autopilot to crash into the hills. At around 6.15 PM, just as the English Channel came into view, Joe toggled a switch on his control panel. And then after he did, he and Bud kind of held their breath for a second to see what would happen. And then a couple of seconds later, the plane kind of shuddered for a second and then leveled out. And then a call came over the radio from one of the pilots who were in the escort planes telling Joe and Bud that they had just successfully taken remote control of the B-24. So at this point, Joe and Bud are no longer flying the aircraft. They're just sitting inside of this flying bomb. Now, there were only two things left for Joe and Bud to do before they could bail out to safety. They would need to arm the plane, so basically arm the explosives and make them ready to detonate. And then after that was done, they would need to call out over the radio, spade flush, the code Joe was given, which would signal to everybody else that the plane was ready and Joe and Bud were jumping out. And so once Joe and Bud nodded to each other and kind of acknowledged that, okay, we're gonna do the last bit of this mission, Joe turned around in a seat and he looked at this control panel that was right behind him and on this panel was the arming switch. And so once Joe flipped this, he and Bud would have a very short window of time to safely escape the aircraft. And so it was kind of like, you know, flip it, make the radio call and get the heck out of there. But Joe and Bud had trained for this moment over and over and over again, so they were ready. And so eventually Joe flipped the switch, grabbed his radio and called out spade flush. What Joe and Bud could not have known when the mechanics were making all these modifications to this B-24 was that one of the mechanics accidentally crossed some wires in putting in all these explosives. And so just seconds after Joe had armed the explosives, they detonated. They were not supposed to, but they did. And so Joe and Bud were killed basically a fraction of a second after calling out Spade Flush. But it would turn out the catastrophic failure of Operation Aphrodite had no impact on World War II. In fact, Operation Aphrodite should never have happened in the first place. It was totally unnecessary. What Joe and Bud and the rest of the American military didn't know at the time was five weeks earlier, the British Royal Air Force dropped a whole bunch of ground penetrating bombs all across those hills in Northern France, and they destroyed all of the vengeance weapons. So when Joe and Bud took off on this doomed mission, there was no threat to London, none. But. That is not the big reveal. Did they not communicate with one another? To know that that mission wasn't necessary? Oh, that's too bad. Oh, that's too bad. 
Here's the reveal in this story. Because Operation Aphrodite changed the course of American history in a really specific and really enormous way. Because Joe, whose full name was Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., was a yep. member of the very famous Kennedy family, a big time political family in America. And at the time, the Kennedys were all saying, Joseph is going to be the next president of the United States. And everybody believed it. He was going to be the guy. But then, of course, Operation Aphrodite changed all of that because Joseph was killed. And so the war would end about a year later, and when it did, Joseph's younger brother, John F. Kennedy, who won that award for heroism and got a Purple Heart early on in the war, and he kind of became a war hero, which prompted Joe to volunteer for Operation Aphrodite, yeah, John would begin his unbelievable political rise. And by 1960, John F. Kennedy, JFK, would become the 35th president of the United States, even though he wasn't supposed to. He was the second choice. It should have been Joe. Yeah, I think even um, Kennedy, um, during the movie, uh, I think it was 13 Days. That's a great movie. If you ever get a chance to watch it, that's a great movie. But during that, um, Kennedy even had a um, thing where he was just like, you know, what would what would my brother do? You know, this would have, this situation would have been handled by my brother. How, what would he have done? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, he just, he he looks like, I mean, you can see it now, but he looked like um, Ted Kennedy. It's too bad. And the father, man, he pushed for his boys to make something. And, you know, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. You want your kids to, to be, you know, Don't know what that was. All right. All right. Well, hope you enjoyed this. Let me, hold on, let me see if there's anything more. As I mentioned earlier, I am now going to go live on. Okay. All right. So we'll end this here. Um, that was interesting. I didn't, I didn't know how Joe died. That was interesting. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed. And until next time, have a good day, have a good night.